appreciate that. Uh, this is, uh, is uh, Professor Mark Mandel. He's with the Medical Microbiology and Immunology Department. And he was born in Tolland, Connecticut. And he went to Williamsville South High School in New York. It's just near Buffalo. And he went to Cornell to study biology. He went to Princeton to get his PhD in molecular biology. Then he came here to UW-Madison to postdoc with Ned Ruby. Some of you might remember uh, Ned's talk from back in 2011 or 2012, something like that. Um, uh, Margaret, I can't pronounce her final name. McFall Nye. McFall Nye. Uh, and Ned Ruby developed this uh, Vibrio and Bobtail Squid as a model organism. Is that fair enough? Yes. Okay. And Mark did his postdoc for four years here. He was here at a very interesting time. He was telling me how the first two years they were here in the medical sciences building, and then uh, halfway through his time here, they moved over to the new um, microbiology, MSB, Microbiological Sciences building. And then he went to Northwestern as a professor in 2010, and he came here in 2017. Uh, so tonight he's going to talk with us about bacteria and the bobtail squid and the kind of cool interactions they have and the, how it works as this pretty interesting model organisms for symbiosis. So would you please join me in welcoming Mark Mendel to Wednesday night at the lab. Well, thank you very much. Uh, is the microphone okay? Um, yeah, as someone who appreciates a good pun, I, I did really enjoy the title you came up with, so I was happy to go with it. So these are the bobtail squid. Um, you'll see some context in some of the other slides, but they're uh, about the size of a golf ball as an adult. And so uh, they're not huge, they're this big. Um, and when they hatch, uh, they're actually the size of Drosophila. So if you didn't have that picture in mind, you could sort of reset expectations about the size of these animals. And, and, and so part of the reason they're so interesting is that they uh, have this organ on the underside of their mantle that houses symbiotic bacteria. It houses just one species called Vibrio fisheri that we'll hear a lot about today. And when the squid acquires Vibrio fisheri from the environment, those uh, bacteria set up shop in the host. They make light for the squid. And what that light does is you have an animal that's Buried in the sand during the day, it comes out at night to forage for food. Now, these are shallow water animals, and when there's a full moon out, um, the light from the moon would make it so there's a, a really uh, significant silhouette or shadow produced by the animal. This light, which comes out of the animal and only shines downward, helps to camouflage that shadow. And on a full moon light, you get a ton of bacterial light coming out, and on a cloudy night, you get less light coming out. And so there are ways that the animal can detect how much ambient light there is here and then alter uh, the amount of light that comes out. And so um, although most of this talk is on the animal and the relationship with bacteria as a model organism, I would contend that this is a really fun and cool and interesting system that's worth studying for its own right. Um, but the question that I'm going to uh, set this up with is, what can glowing squid teach us about the relationships between microbes and animals? Yeah. And so I want to back up a little bit and talk about what we know about microbes and humans. And I'm talking here about the microbiome, the microbes that live consistently um, in our intestines, on our skin, and other areas of our body. Um, we are basically born sterile, but begin to acquire these microbes uh, shortly after or, or during birth. And uh, what's become clear, um, it, it was clear in these early studies uh, about 12, 13 years ago, and, and it's been maintained, is that there are different proportions of the types of microbes that appear in different places. So you don't have to read any of these words, uh, but you can see in the colon, we have about equal amounts of these two large groups of bacteria, whereas on the skin, you get a different distribution, and there's a different group that actually makes up maybe half the bacteria on our skin. And that specificity extends even to, to lower levels than, than just large organ systems. So if you look within one organ, the skin, um, what you can see here is, uh, it doesn't show up that well, but you can see these pie charts are really different, right? So um, in, in places like the forehead's going to be really different than uh, on top of the foot. Okay. And so um, 
I'm going to have one more slide here to emphasize this specificity. So in this study, um, they're grouping bacteria uh, from uh, men and women, um, from a number of different individuals that were collected on different days. And what you can see is all these colors are mixed together. If they say, do these sort by day, or do they sort by who it came from, or do they sort by whether they're men or women, and you don't see that. However, if you take the same data and you color it by where it came from, <coughs> this striking pattern emerges, right, where um, you can distinguish one's bacteria that came from the mouth from those from the gut, uh, from those on the skin. And um, you may know this from your own experience, that people make pretty lousy subjects to figure out um, how basic processes occur. Um, we don't let ourselves get controlled in this way. And so we turn to model systems to ask, how does a, a specificity of this sort get established? When an animal's born, how does it get colonized with specific microbes and avoid getting colonized with other ones? So there have been a number of model systems that have been developed uh, to study different aspects of this. So on one end of the spectrum, we have uh, uh, vertebrate systems like mice and zebrafish, where you either take their natural microbiome, or you take the human microbiome, or you take a few species to introduce, and you can study functional relationships in the host. And those have been really powerful. Um, in the middle here, we have some systems where you have a natural consortium of maybe 2 to 12 species of bacteria that occur. Um, and uh, especially in sort of these insect systems, uh, they're there naturally, so they've co-evolved with their host. Um, and that provides a really useful system to study how they get there and what they do once they're there. Um, and then the other end of the spectrum are these binary systems, one host and one bacteria. Okay? And so uh, that's where the squid falls in, the, the light organ of the squid. And, um, and so that provides us a way we can really reduce this down to uh, really, uh, really narrow things. So I would say there's, you know, every model is good for some things and not as good for others. And this system, I think, is really good for asking these questions of when an animal is born, how does it get the right bacteria, the right microbes? And so Tom had a, a bit of an introduction to the system here. This has been um, really extensive studies on the host and the symbiont. Um, that have been spearheaded by Ned Ruby and Margaret McFall Nye, um, and people have studied with them. Um, so that's been over the past 30 years or so. Uh, we can image directly the site of the infection. You'll see that now. So although we add the bacteria to the seawater, uh, within three hours, every animal has acquired the bacteria. It's really such an efficient process. Um, we can get thousands of symbiont-free hosts from just a dozen or so adult animals uh, that got bred in the lab um, for, those, uh, for those offspring. We can easily manipulate bacterial genes, and you'll see a lot of that in the talk. Um, and we know the whole genome sequence of the symbiont, um, and more recently, the host. Okay. So again, it's all driving towards this fundamental question of how does the host acquire and maintain its specific symbiont. So I want to tell you a little bit about the logistics of studying squid. So the worst part is when we have to go to Hawaii <laughs> and uh, go collect the animals. Um, and we do this a couple times a year. Uh, like I said, we'll bring back uh, about a dozen or so adults to the lab. Uh, they live in these tank systems where they, uh, we pamper them um, and feed them uh, abundant shrimp. Uh, and then in these systems, they lay eggs. We then move it to a separate uh, egg system that has much fewer bacteria on it. Um, and this is what the egg mass of the squid looks like with all sand matted in there, and it sort of has a, a glue-type substance that it uses to stick the eggs under the side of rocks. Um, if you flip it over just to see the eggs, you can see them here. So this is a mass of maybe 400 eggs or so um, laid by one female. And so um, when they hatch from the eggs about a month later, uh, oh, and just for size comparison, this is an adult animal with sort of a bunch of teenagers here. Um, and again, this adult is, is golf ball sized. Um, and then when they hatch, you can see they're much smaller. Now they're uh, fruit fly sized, and I have a video to show you them swimming around. And so the size of this is a petri plate. So these are very small, uh, and uh, they thrive in the lab for the first four days on a yolk sac, and we don't need to feed anything. So, so these are very well-controlled experiments um, using these 
direct offspring of these natural animals. Okay, so if we go back to here and zoom in on one of those animals, um, what you can see is the eyes, the tentacles, and the arms. Um, this uh, ski cap structure here is a mantle, and water flows into the mantle, over the gills, over the light organ here, and the ink sac is below it, which is that dark structure, and then out the funnel. And this pumping of water is what brings oxygenated water into the squid um, for it to live, and that also carries environmental bacteria over the light organ surface. But this seawater typically has about a million bacteria in every cubic centimeter, every milliliter. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Vibrio fisheri, at, at its highest abundance in seawater, is going to be about 100 out of those million. And so there's been a series of processes by which the bacteria and the squid communicate so that Vibrio fisheri and Vibrio fisheri alone ends up inside the animal. Um, and so part of that involves mucus production by the host. Let me give you some context here. So I'm now going to zoom in on this box here right above the light organ in an animal that's had the mantle dissected off. So we're looking right at the symbiotic structure. And the animal produces mucus that you can see here in the green. And bacteria stick to this mucus. It's fairly nonspecific, but it begins to enrich for ones that can do that, including Vibrio fisheri. Yeah, the next slide is going to be the same structure with these ciliated appendages on either side of the organ. Um, the mucus is not going to be stained here. Instead, these are bacteria that are expressing a green fluorescent protein. And you can see not only have the bacteria stuck to the mucus, but they've aggregated together. And they've started to migrate to one of these three pores that leads to the internal anatomy of the organ. They'll then swim into the internal uh, light organ ducts and crypts. And they'll fill these crypt spaces on each side of the organ. It doesn't cross over, but within each side, there's all these dead-end uh, epithelial-lined crypts. If we look at what that looks like two days later, this happens very fast. Um, this is the host cells. Um, you get this microvillar border against here. And then these are bacterial cells packed in there super tightly. And the bacteria stay there um, basically all night, and they make light in the morning. 95% of the bacteria in the host get expelled. The remaining 5% grow up during the day. Then they make light for the host at night. Um, and then that process repeats. So the only time that they get inoculated with new bacteria is at the beginning of their life. Okay? They get those new bacteria in, um, and, and those are the ones that form that population. Uh, by expelling them every day, they sort of, uh, I think, clear out this house party that's been going on inside. Uh, probably a lot of waste is accumulating there, and so it gives the host a chance to reset its tissue. Um, and it's also seeding the surrounding ocean with these bacteria so that when their sisters and offspring uh, hatch from their eggs, there's an abundant supply of bacteria in the seawater. Okay, so I wanted to look at the big picture. Using the system, what have we learned about microbe animal interactions? So I have um, a set of concepts that have been really uh, had big impact on microbiology and on biology in general. Uh, very few of these are from my work, um, but I think they're a really important illustration to show the value of this system and, and what we gain from it. So I think one of the big ideas is that bacteria, although we, uh, although they are microscopic single-celled organisms, much of what they do is acting in groups. And there's two uh, main examples from this system. The first is a process called quorum sensing, and I'm just going to walk through it here briefly. So if every cell in a population is sending out a, a chemical signal, here it's called an autoinducer, and then the bacteria also have a receptor by which they can receive that signal, then if they're the only cell around, that chemical is going to diffuse away, and they're never going to receive the signal. However, if they're in a pack of bacteria, and there's a lot there, then the, the concentration of that chemical will rise. And now, the receptor will see the signal and go on to do something else. In this case, the bacteria make light. So they only make that light. It takes a lot of energy. They only do that when they're in a group, and it's actually going to have an effect. Um, but the same process occurs in a number of bacteria. It's how cholera in the human gut know that they're, they're, they're in there. They're all concentrated. Uh, we better go find someplace else. And so that initiates the end of the, that process, um, in case anyone has a experience with cholera. Um, and then uh, 
It also, uh, for example, um, in cystic fibrosis patients in the lungs, uh, are, they're really susceptible to uh, infection. And bacteria that infect those lungs, the way that they know that they're all together and it's worth mounting an attack on us um, is a very, very similar system. So this plays an important role in a lot of host-associated um, and environmental bacteria. Another example of bacteria acting in groups is a process called biofilm formation, where um, they assemble, they uh, secrete a, uh, a polysaccharide matrix around the cells, and that sort of encases them in a way that protects them, for example, from antibiotics. And so a lot of the problems we have treating bacteria with antibiotics are because the bacteria are not these individual single cells, but they're all together as a, a, a gooey clump. And in this system, the bacteria actually have to clump together on the way into the host. If they don't do that, then they can't resist the insults coming from the host, and they remain outside. And I've, I'll go into more detail on that later on. OK, on this uh, sort of big concepts idea, um, this is really the first system where we're showing the bacteria have an important impact on animal development. And so this originated um, in studies that were published in 1994. Um, and what this is showing is a, a cartoon of a juvenile light organ. This is what I showed you before. It has these appendages sticking off the sides that make the mucus to recruit the bacteria. The adult light organ, though, is only this part with a dotted line. It has this core light organ, but these extra structures here are not there. And, and the organ also looks quite different here, but uh, that's why it's highlighted so you can see that. And so what happens is, once the bacteria get inside the host, they release part of their cell wall. That then signals to the host and leads to the death of those appendages. And so here you can see if you don't have bacteria, uh, they get a little smaller, but they're still quite present here two weeks later. Once you get colonized with bacteria, though, uh, seven days later, they're, they're almost gone and, and they're essentially undetectable by two weeks. And so this was really the first time that I was shown that bacteria have this profound impact on animals uh, and, and that that's important for their development. Um, I want to fast forward to a recent paper. This is not in squid. This is in zebrafish. Um, but what this study showed was in a very similar way that a, a, a single bacterial gene is required to stimulate uh, beta cells in the zebrafish pancreas. And so you can see that here. If there's no bacteria around, there's very few of these green uh, insulin producing cells. Um, if you have bacteria present, uh, you get the, these cells. And if you have no bacteria, but you add this one gene that does it, you can see this really uh, phenomenal impact. Okay? And so I think this is a general concept that is, uh, we've seen in a lot of other systems. We know, for example, if, if uh, animals lack a microbiota, mice lack microbiota, um, that uh, their immune system does not develop properly, and there are a number of tissues that do not develop in the same way as when the bacteria are present. And I will, that reminds me to say, I will be lazy about saying bacteria versus microbes because I study bacterium, but there are many other important microbes, including uh, uh, single cell eukaryotes and uh, fungi and archaea um, that likely have uh, very important roles in a similar fashion. Okay, so back to squid. Um, we learned recently that bacteria stab each other for territory. And so uh, some strains of Vibrio fistri have this uh, apparatus here. Um, and they assemble it in the cell. And when they contract, it sends this spear into the neighboring cell and actually delivers toxins to that cell. And so uh, this is a little cartoon. It's a little hard to see the colors. I'll just describe it, which is that if you have two strains and, and none of them have this, then they can coexist peacefully in the same crypts inside the host. Um, if one of them has the system and the other one doesn't, then that goes on to kill uh, everything in that area, um, and, and it takes over. However, if you have two strains that both have very, very similar systems here, then everyone's immune to it, and, and again, they can coexist in, in that fashion, although it's a little less stable. Um, and these have been discovered in other bacteria. These were initially discovered um, in Vibrio cholera um, uh, and, and then subsequently studied in a number of organisms. Uh, and, uh, uh, but this was really the first demonstration that had this uh, significant effect in the host uh, that it lives in normally. 
Okay, this is not the Vibrio fisheri, but it was cool and I wanted to share it, which is that animals can use bacteria to protect their eggs. And so it is still the squid system. These are different bacteria that live uh, within the, the egg-laying part of the, of the female. And what normally happens is that uh, mama squid deposits these bacteria in the egg casings. Um, and those bacteria produce an antibiotic or an antifungal compound that protects them. And you can see these are nice, healthy individual <coughs> eggs. If you get rid of the bacteria that the mom has deposited there, then these quickly get overcome with fungus. They do not survive to the point that they make it. So that's actually a totally different symbiosis within the squid system, um, and that's essential for the viability of the offspring. OK, the last one of these um, is that animals can attract bacteria with chemicals. And so what we're looking at here is this is what the bacteria see as they're about to enter inside the ducts of the animal. And there's this chitin that's being trafficked out, um, out of the host. Um, it gets degraded at the surface of that duct, and the bacteria can smell that degraded chitin. And they say, aha, that's where I want to go. And they need to, to see that signal, to, to sense that signal, to be able to go into the inside of the host. If we take um, some chitin sugars and we flood the water with it, so now the bacteria smell it, but they smell it everywhere, and they don't know where to go. They get very close, but instead of going inside, they sort of wander off. Okay, so something that's really been of interest to my lab is this question of why does only one species of bacterium colonize the host? What's so special about that? And as you'll see, it's actually only certain strains of Vibrio fisheri too. Okay. And so uh, to study this, we, uh, we uh, started with a, a comparative analysis. Um, these are light-producing Vibrio fisheri in both the Hawaiian bobtail squid, which we've been talking about, and the Japanese pinecone fish. Uh, we've talked about how the squid have a light organ on their underside. Um, the pinecone fish also have a light organ. Um, it's in the jaw of the, of the animal. Uh, the bacteria live in there, and they're really bright. Right? And so instead of in the squid case where this dim amount of light is being used for camouflage, in the fish, this incredible amount of light is used to attract bacteria, uh, sorry, to attract prey, uh, like worms and stuff that are living in coral reefs, and attract them to the animal. And so the sort of relative amounts of light here is really different. Um, and that makes these really fun to actually look at on plates. Um, however, for this talk, what I want you to focus on is that these bacteria, although it's the same species, they typically cannot colonize squid. So if we take them, we put them in a bowl with a squid, and we look you know, three hours later, we do not see colonization. And so um, these are the players here for this comparative study. Uh, we knew the whole genome sequence of one of the, bac uh, of the bacterium ES114, which came from the squid. And we want to now compare that to a genome from the fish okay? and say, if we study the bacterial genes, can we see what's different about this? Can we see why fish symbionts can't colonize squid? And so I'm going to show you this very uh, broad comparison. And basically, red means similar, and there's a lot of red. And so this is a, a cartoon of the, of the symbiont from the squid up here, the symbiont from the fish. Um, to give some sense of scale, bacterial genomes have about 4,000 genes in them. And what we found was that 90% of those were identical between the two. So we started looking at the other ones. And you can see there's some big regions of it that are different between the two. But one gene caught our eye right away. And this is the gene RSCS. Um, so RSCS was initially discovered in Karen Weissig's lab at Loyola Chicago. And what she saw was that it's required for that aggregation phenotype, for the bacteria to stick together. And what we noticed when we did this comparison was that it's present in the squid symbiont, but it's completely absent in the fish symbiont. It's like it was never there. Um, and so we asked whether this could be playing an important role. And so I'm going to show one pathway here of how the genes signal. And this is how we think about it, of proteins that receive a signal from the outside of the bacterium, and then signal them to cause changes in gene expression uh, in the symbiont. But I'm going to simplify this for the rest of the talk and just say we've got a sensor called RSCS. It turns on biofilm genes, which are then start this cascade for squid colonization. 
And so the first thing we asked is, okay, so we don't have this in the fish nabat. Do we have any of this? And so what we did, oh, sorry, the experiment here is overexpressing this. And if the bacteria aggregate, we can start to see this in culture. And so um, if we add this to our squid symbiont, you can see the bacteria become wrinkly on plates because they're sticking together. Um, and they form this aggregate on the surface of liquid. And when we add this to uh, the fish symbiont, we get these same phenotypes. Okay? And so that told us that um, even though the fish symbiont only has this part of the pathway, and the squid symbiont has the whole pathway, it told us that the fish symbiont really did have this part of the pathway. Right? It was functional. We could add this in artificially and get biofilm formation. So then we said, what happens when you colonize the squid? And so here what I'm showing is uh, uh, our normal squid symbiont. Um, and let me describe the experiment. So we take uh, about 40 squid in a bowl, or in this case, about 10 squid in a bowl. Um, we, add, we grow the bacteria in the lab from the freezer. We add them to the bowl. We mix them well. We let them go for three hours. We then move the squid to new bowls, or new water. Um, and at 48 hours, we then ask whether they're colonized or not. That gives the bacteria that did make it in time to amplify, and we can detect it both by their luminescence and by the counts of bacteria inside. And so what you can see is uh, uh, if we add bacteria here, uh, we can get about, uh, you know, let's say, 100,000 or, or 10 to 100,000 bacteria in there at two days. Like I mentioned, if we add the fish symbiont, though, it cannot colonize squid. And we thought maybe um, it just was worse at it. And so we put it in with 10 times as many bacteria, and it still can't colonize the squid. But what about this gene that's missing? If we add that back, if we add back RSCS, what you can see is now these can colonize uh, the squid. All right? And I'm not showing it here, but I told you that these fish amounts are really bright, and now the squid are 100 times brighter than they usually are. Uh, with the squid symbiont. Yeah. Okay, so I've told you that a single regulator called RSCS has a profound impact on host specificity. Um, so then we want to know, what about the evolution of this? Was RSCS um, gained in the squid symbionts, or was it always there, but then it got lost in the fish symbionts? Perhaps they didn't need it anymore. So to do that, we built an evolutionary tree of Vibrio fish fry. And I'm going to start by showing you the ones I've been talking about. So this is the squid symbiont. This is the fish symbiont. I'm going to fill in the other strain names, but they're basically irrelevant for the talk. Um, it was just weird for me to look at it without uh, anything labeled. Uh, and then on this, I'm now going to put um, where they came from. So you can see these are uh, Hawaiian squid isolates down here, the, the blue squid icon. Uh, the green squid are from Japan. Uh, the green fish are also from Japan. So these are fish and squid isolates from around the world, but, but mostly from the North Pacific Ocean. And so then we asked which of these strains have RSCS, right? The question here is, was it gained or was it lost? And what we found is that the ancestral group here does not have RSCS, but that it was acquired once. And all these organisms have the RSCS DNA. And so when we look at where the squid symbionts and where the fish symbionts are, you can see is that uh, there's some exceptions, but in large part, these are squid symbionts and these are fish symbionts. Okay? And so it seems that getting this one gene allowed Vibrio fisheri to move from perhaps a more fish-associated lifestyle to now have this new option to live inside the squid. And so for this question of specificity, what determines where a bacterium can live and what determines which bacteria colonize a new animal. Uh, here's our model where uh, the middle of, of that group of Vibrio fisheri um, has a sensor. They turn on biofilm genes and they turn on squid colonization. They enable squid colonization. Um, I moved some stuff around, so these, I'm going to go back here. Uh, what I'm calling group C will become apparent, uh, but it's this ancestral group up here. And so in the ancestral group of Vibrio fisheri, they're lacking RSCS. So even the, though the rest of this is intact, it doesn't get turned on at the right time, and they can't colonize squid. Now what about all those other million bacteria in seawater? Well, we, we've looked at some of them. Uh, we, we plan on looking at more. But in general, most of them lack the biofilm genes. And so it doesn't really matter whether or not they have the regulator. The few that have the biofilm genes 
also lack uh, uh, the regulator. And so there's a break in the pathway that, that limits their ability to colonize squid. So my conclusions from this part of the talk is that group behaviors, um, in this case, biofilm formation, the ability of bacteria to aggregate together, um, is important in the normal life cycle of bacteria. Um, and that small genetic changes can have big consequences, right? If you have this gene, you can set up shop in the squid host. If not, you can't. And we're still seeking to fully understand uh, how bacteria evolved to establish and maintain their interactions with animal hosts. So the lab had a paper earlier this year um, that actually broke this evolutionary tree down into more categories. Um, so we know there's actually three different ways that bacteria can regulate biofilm formation. And we're now working to understand um, what is it that regulates them under these different conditions. Okay, for the last part of the talk, um, I want to switch gears and look at a different area in the lab. And uh, so the squid system provides a really neat opportunity to ask, what bacterial genes are required to get into the host. And you've seen some examples of that already. Um, but uh, what we can do is take a large, complex mixture of bacteria, introduce them to the host, and ask which ones get in and which one don't. And so I'm going to show that here. These are, again, all vibrio fish fry. In this case, it's all the, the single strain that we uh, focus on. Um, and this is representing three of the 4,000 genes in the bacteria. And what we can do is make a library where basically every gene in the genome, uh, or most genes, um, get mutated. And so here, this strain has the other 3,999 genes, um, but it's lacking the purple one. And so I'm going to represent that with a purple oval. Um, here, these are lacking uh, the green one, so it's a green oval. And we do this randomly, and so we get about 50,000 mutants that are uh, distributed around the genome. So we have this starting pool of mutants. And then we introduce it to the squid. In this case, we've done 1,500 squid. And then we ask which mutants were there at the beginning of the experiment and which mutants were there at the end of the experiment. And so in this case, what you can see is that the green ones are no longer present. And so uh, our, our null hypothesis then for what's going on is that the green gene encodes a green protein that's really important to associate with the squid. And so if you interrupt that, if you mutate that, now, all of a sudden, you are not successful in this colonization assay. And by doing all the genes at once, it means we can look at broad patterns. So this isn't in the squid, actually. This is just in culture. Um, and we can have a really good estimate of what genes are essential for the bacteria to live, because we never isolate mutations in them, or we don't isolate very many. Um, and that's about uh, four to 500 genes. Um, and the other 3,500 or so, um, you can make mutants in, and then we can go study how they do in the animal. And so uh, using this process, we've identified about 300 new genes that may be playing a role in colonization of the host. And we've already talked a lot about how bacterial aggregation, they have to stick together to get in. And so one assay that we can do in culture is ask here, um, how do they do when they aggregate in culture? So we artificially induce the biofilm system, and we get this wrinkled colony that you saw before. In some cases, we see a little bit of a defect in it. But what you can see here is uh, strains that lack the gene DNAJ uh, really do not make any biofilm formation. They do not aggregate in culture. So we've taken this uh, large screen in the animal. We've now done these secondary screens in culture, because we can do that more quickly. And now we want to bring it back to the animal and say, does this affect the logic of, of bacterial host relationships? Um, and I wouldn't be showing this to you if it didn't have an effect, so you can know where this is going. Uh, here we add uh, our, our, our normal bacteria, and they colonize well. If they're missing uh, that protein, DNAJ, they don't colonize well. If we add it back in, they can colonize again. And this is that image I showed toward the beginning, where normally uh, these green fluorescent protein expressing, expressing bacteria aggregate, they clump in the host, which uh, likely makes them more resistant two insults from the host. Um, DNAJ, we can see them, if uh, strains that lack it. Uh, we can see individual cells. We don't see these clumps. And they're unable to colonize. So uh, one of the students in the lab, uh, Ruth Eisenberg, is pursuing this to ask, how does DNAJ um, have this effect? 
So uh, we've also uh, looked at factors that have the opposite effect. So I was telling you we identified DNAJ because it was required for this interaction. We've also identified genes that see when they're gone, uh, the bacteria colonize better. Okay? And, and so in this case, if you're missing this regulator called BIN-K, uh, so here's a normal clump of bacteria uh, in one's bacteria that have BIN-K, and bacteria that lack BIN-K, they make these clumps that are 10 times as large. And you might say, well, clumping is good, uh, symbiosis is good, so why don't they just do this regularly? Why haven't they evolved to lose this? And, and I'll tell you, they have not evolved to lose it. So if we look across the evolutionary tree, BIN-K is conserved. And so one idea is that uh, if you make these huge clumps and you don't release very well, then maybe that expulsion process where you get expelled from the host, uh, maybe that doesn't go very well. Maybe you stay in, you sort of overstay your welcome, and it doesn't give the host time to reset. And so that's one question that we're looking at. Um, so a grad student lab, uh, Denise Tarnowski, has been really focused on uh, how BIN-K works. So for this part, um, I just want to emphasize that we can use these global genetic approaches to identify factors um, and use a mix of assays both uh, in, in the animal and in culture-based assays to get at what the functional uh, issues are. Um, and some of the first genes we've identified during, in this process affect biofilm formation, affect this aggregation process. So I think it's another piece of evidence that this is really important in the normal life cycle of these uh, bacteria. So I want to be sure to acknowledge uh, people who have done the work. So this is the current lab from our recent holiday party, um, as well as collaborators um, and funding agencies. Um, I have this cartoon that I thought was uh, pretty cute, um, where this anglerfish that's luminous is, is lighting all these squid. I hope from the talk today you know how scientifically inaccurate it is, that that's not how the squid acquire their luminescent bacteria. Uh, but I thought it was pretty great. Uh, so. Thank you. I'd love to take questions. Hmm? What's that? Where's the ninth candle? I, it, it's the anglerfish. What's it? The anglerfish is the one that is the is the one lighting the others. Here, I'll, I'll play it again. <laughs> oh, okay. There's the ninth. Doesn't uh, have nine candles? Yeah. So the, the shamash in the middle is the one that lights all the others. Oh, I can see that. <laughs> Thank you. And is that a olive oil? <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Uh, early in the talk, you showed the video of the hatchlings of the uh, petri dish, and only a few of them were moving. Are the rest of them dead or? Not developed enough to move around, or is it, or yeah, why, why yeah, great question, nice observation. So um, they were alive, but I mentioned to you how in daylight the bacteria settle down and hide in the sand, and then at nighttime, uh, then they're foraging for food. And so the the cue typically for daylight is that they they will settle on whatever dish they're on. Yeah, and so it's you know it's artificial daylight in the lab, but it's Light, nonetheless. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. What happens? What do you expect might be the effect in the <coughs> wild if the bobtail squid managed to have that hundred times more light? Yeah. Of the the fish version of the vibrio with the extra gene add. Yes. Yeah. If, if all your experiment escaped into the wild, <laughs> I realize. Well, that we'll that's make sure that doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, so that experiment's been done um, by a couple groups, more, most recently by uh, Cheryl Westrow's lab at University of New Hampshire. And what they did was they took um, bacteria that were bright and then evolved them through the squid in a, you know, hundreds of generations. And very quickly, the luminescence diminishes. Um, but it doesn't go dark, and so it goes very close to what we see in these natural symbionts. And so I think the hypothesis for that, which, which may or may not be true, but it, you know, sort of a first pass, is that because it's expensive to make the light, if you don't have 
selection to maintain that high level of light, then it's much better to uh, you know, sort of diminish that. What I didn't really say explicitly was that um, you have, the symbionts have to make some light, um, even though they're pretty dim. If you introduce a dark mutant, it'll get into the squid, but then it starts getting weeded out, okay? so that over a few weeks, it's gone. And not only if you just do that alone, but if you introduce in competition a regular one that makes light and a dark one, they'll both get in. But then starting at about 48 hours, that dark one is at a disadvantage. Um, perhaps it gets preferentially expelled. But there's some way that the, the squid creates this environment that if you're not making light, uh, you don't stay in there. So it's punishing cheaters and saying you can't stay for a free ride. That's so. an academic squid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What is the name of the signaling molecule by the squid? I believe you call it an autoenhancer or something way at the start. Yeah. And then intracellular within the bacteria, they have a receptor that other bacteria don't, and it doesn't bind to those receptors, or what's the mechanism there? Yeah, know? so um, the first part, the autoinducer yeah. here, um, is actually, it's a, made by the bacteria, but then it only accumulates inside the squid where the bacteria are all packed in there. Okay. Um, and then the receptor for that then turns on gene. So it's, it's sort of a funny system, right? It's like, you know, if you were in a sort of this closed room, and you're throwing a ball, and you just throw it off, you're unlikely to get hit by the ball. But if you're in the room, if all of us here, and all had a ball to throw, you're gonna get hit by the ball. And, right, and so you're basically responding in that way to something that you yourself are making, but so are all your brothers and sisters there. So it's also so, like quorum sensing? It's or? exactly right. So the quorum sensing was discovered in Vibrio Fisher. Okay, yeah. all right, yeah. okay. So, but then the question of how closely related you have to be to be sending and receiving the same signal. And so what's known is that some of these signals are very specific, that uh, basically they don't work uh, across species boundaries. And there's others that are much more general. So there's one called autoinducer 2 um, that you, know, you can receive and interpret that signal of your Vibrio fistri, if your salmonella, um, you know, a whole number of bacteria. And so uh, it's been suggested that that gives you a sense of how many bacteria are total are in your environment. Uh, whereas the, the other autoinducer gives you a sense of how many of your own brothers and sisters are there. Yeah. And so for the example of making light, it's very unlikely that distant bacteria could contribute to that. And so, yeah. Is there something about the boundary conditions of the Hawaiian uh, squid that, that, uh, of your ecology that force this mechanism? Yeah. So. Um, Aside from being shallow water, I don't know. Um, but there are similar symbiosis worldwide. So there's uh, some of the Mediterranean Sea. It's a different species of squid, but, but look very, very similar. Um, and they also have bacteria in a light organ. Um, there's similar ones in uh, Japan and Australia and in other places. Um, and so it seems like the requirement is that you have access to a symbiont uh, and that you have sand that you can hide in. And what I mean by that is, um, the Big Island of Hawaii, for example, which is uh, you know, from recent lava flows, you don't have sandy beaches typically, and, and you don't find these same animals there. They just don't, don't live there. Yeah. In the Mediterranean, there's an interesting twist on this, which is that um, it's not just Vibrio fisheri. And so there's a cold water relative called Vibrio logii, and they'll both get into the squid, and when under colder months, or colder depths in the ocean, you get more of Vibrio logii there. Um, and how that plays out and how that's mediated is not at all understood. Yeah. So I remember being at a sandy beach on the west side of the Big Island, and I you know, volunteered to go look for the squid there. Would that be possible? Uh, sure, we'll talk about that, yeah. As long as you're uh, you know, getting yourself there, sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We'd love to have them. Um, are there genetics on the squid side? So I'll get back to that question. So um, I, I took this out, but maybe I should have left it in that um, because this is in water, a really nice feature of the system is that you can add chemicals and they'll diffuse everywhere in the system. 
So we use that as a trick to induce bacterial genes uh, in a specific way, and we know that the compounds we add will get where they need to go. We can also use it to inhibit processes in the squid. So there was a study um, about 15 years ago where they inhibited nitric oxide synthase from the host using a diffusible inhibitor, and that led to much more aggregation of the bacteria, suggesting that well, nitric oxide produced by the host is one of the ways that it keeps the bacterial population in check as it's coming in. Um, so, to, but to make specific genetic uh, modulations, that's something that's really just starting. So the genome sequence of the squid just came out about a year ago. Um, what's that? Which means you can now do CRISPR. Yep, exactly. So there's a group at uh, Woods Hole, um, at the Marine Biology Lab there, that's been really active in getting CRISPR technology working. And so I'm excited for that to become more widespread. And what's the life cycle for these? Would you be doing the CRISPR at a egg cell or an embryo zygote cell? I don't know anything about Yeah, it, um, I haven't done it, but um, my, my guess is that you'd be injecting into the egg. Right. Yeah. So uh, at this point, we don't have inbred lines of squid in the same way that you have for other animals. Um, and it's a pro and a con. So, I mean, the con is where, uh, you know, when we can collect, uh, there's a lot of natural variation in it. But we know that things we find are robust to uh, that variation that's out there um, in the wild now. Um, something, uh, so Woods, uh, this is sort of started by a group at Monterey Bay Aquarium, and now it's been picked up by Woods Hole as a way to culture the squid um, and have that be in a more controlled way. And so that opens up doors to um, developing lines in that way. Yeah, it's a great question. So we'd like to. Um, so at Monterey Bay, they were able to take the squid out to seven generations. Um, but uh, each time, they, each generation, they were a little smaller. They reached sexual maturity earlier, for example. Um, when I was in Chicago, the Shed Aquarium tried uh, doing that for us. And they, were, they had a really great success for that first generation. But then we didn't get a second generation. Um, and so uh, I think the culturing methods are still being worked out. One thing that Monterey Bay and Woods Hole have in common that is different at Shed is that it's natural seawater. And uh, right, so a big take home from the talk is that the bacteria um, affect you know, processes in animals. And so I wonder if that's the case. Now, that's not exclusively it, because there's a lab in Connecticut that's been very successful at this as well. So I think, um, I think the hope would be that long term we could um, we can do that readily. But, nobody, but you don't know why it's happening. We don't know why at this point, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was reading recently, and this is maybe off topic here, but I was reading recently about something that's called uh, ex uh, extranuclear DNA that sits in the cytoplasm itself and rather than in the bacteria, rather than in, in its defining DNA. Hmm. Uh, and do you distinguish between where the DNA comes from. And, I mean, because I was reading about E. coli being an example where that extra, uh, the extra nucleate is involved with, with uh, the, uh, the uh, virility of a disease or something like hmm. this. And is there a distinction made between looking at the defining prop DNA properties and this extra nuclear uh, DNA that sits in the cytoplasm separately? Yeah, so you know, there's a, a lot of, for example, antibiotic resistance genes that are carried on plasmids. And it's a small circular piece of DNA, maybe 10,000 base pairs, 10,000 letters of DNA. Um, and because it's separate from the main chromosome, it can be easily transferred among cells. Some of our strains have plasmids, some of them don't. Uh, some of them may and we don't know. Um, as DNA sequencing technology has gotten a lot better, it's, we can sort of better get at that on a, a larger scale. Um, but for example, so ES114, the main squid symbiont here, um, it has one big plasmid with about 55 genes on it. Um, some of the strains that colonize just as well do that without those plasmids. So I think we don't fully understand the role of it right now. Yeah. Yeah. So you said earlier Yeah. 
Yes. How do you know how to go out of your neck? I, I don't know, but I can guess. <laughs> so that's a great question. I couldn't hear the question. Oh, sure. Sorry, I should have repeated the question. So the question was, how is it that the squid is able to modulate the amount of bacterial light coming out in response to uh, you know, how much ambient light there is? And what we know is that um, the ink sac sits right above um, the light organ. Okay? And, and the opaqueness of the ink sac is part of why the light gets directed downward. Other aspects are the ink sac has uh, insoluble reflectin proteins that are deposited along there. So just like in a flashlight, how there's a reflector plate behind the light, here you have that on the bottom of the ink sac, which helps the, the light come downward. Now, in the juvenile that we typically study for these experiments, it has a sort of wimpy little ink sac. But in the adult, as it grows, there are these uh, sort of appendages to the ink sac, and the adult can bring those around like a shutter and close off a lot of that light. Okay. So that's very likely one way that happens. Um, oxygen is critical for this reaction, uh, and so I suspect that there's also a faster response um, by which the host can release or withhold oxygen uh, from the bacteria and control the amount of light that way, you know, if a, if a cloud comes in and covers the moon or something like that. But, but that's all speculation. Cool. Yeah. So in addition to intensity, what's, what do you know about the wavelengths or wavelengths that the bacteria are making and how does that match up with the wavelengths that they're getting from Yeah, so the question was, how do, what are the wavelengths of, of light that come from uh, the bacteria and then comes out the squid? And, uh, and how does that uh, relate to the wavelengths that are available you know, from the, uh, the moonlight that's coming through the water? So it's blue light that come out from these bacteria. Um, and that's uh, consistent with you know, what's available there um, as a way to camouflage them. Yeah. And do you have any variants that make other wavelengths, or is that not? Yeah, so the, it seems like, I think I'm up to date on this, but I'm not sure. So uh, it, it seems like most of the luciferase enzymes produce blue light. There are some cases where uh, bacteria then uh, refract the light before it leaves the cell. And so an example of this is the earliest yellow fluorescent protein that was identified, it wasn't actually um, a protein itself that was giving it, it was modifying the blue light um, from the bacteria. Yeah. So, the, so I understand that there's a lab that uses seawater and they're uh, better at reproduction, and, and then there's is there another lab that doesn't use seawater that's successful, and that they looked at inhibiting some of the bacteria in, in the seawater to find out what, what the ecology is that keeps them alive? Yeah. So I'd say it's a, pr it's a coarse correlation right now. I think that's a great thing to look at, and I'll be on the phone next week to uh, <laughs> see if I can interest them in doing that. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's really a small number of groups that have had success with this right now. Um, and a lot, of, um, a lot of them that have taken it through multiple generations, it's really a dedicated person that is focused on that. And so, um, I don't know how general the pattern is or whether it's just you know, what people have, you know, individuals who have had it work and not. Um, and I, I, I mean all respect to the people who have and no slight to those who haven't. I'm in that group, so. <laughs> yeah. Recently there's uh, some kind of light uh, given off at flying squirrels in northern Wisconsin. Oh. And any kind of relationship between the comet that this kind of light goes up to Cool. So the question is about light um, being released by flying squirrels in northern Wisconsin. I actually don't know about that. That sounds very cool. Um, there are a lot of examples. <laughs> so yeah, there's a lot of examples of bioluminescence in nature. And actually, I think I came to one of these talks about 10 years ago when I was here by Michael Wollenberg, where he went through. Um, different sort of, you know, rotting uh, organisms that release light, um, phytoplankton uh, in, in the water that gives sort of the milky seas appearance as 
uh, ship's report going through, and as it's going through, you get this amazing bioluminescence on both sides of the ship. Um, there's a bioluminescent bay in Puerto Rico um, where a lot of those organisms live. Um, and in many cases, it's the, uh, the multicellular organism itself that makes the light. Um, but then there is a subset of cases where uh, they've enlisted uh, bacteria to do that for them. Yeah. So my guess is the squirrel would be itself, but it could be some sort of parasite that's, that's living on it that's doing it. So the cuttlefish and the octopus are pretty famous for uh, their light sensing, and I don't know what the fancy word is for the pumpkins and everything. Yeah. Does your bobtail squid have that ability to sense really intricate changes in light, and do they do that? Yeah. So. Um, Everything I've told you right is about this light that's going. So the question was about um, how does a squid sense light and camouflage itself um, in other contexts? And so all this light's going down, it still needs to hide from something that's looking at it from above. And that's exactly where these chromatophores come in. And so these cells, they look brownish here. Um, and when the cells, when the pigment fills the cell, you get that brown color. When it holds the pigment in the middle of the cell, you get just a dot of pigment, and it's basically a white skin layer. And so it can do, um, I haven't seen them do the complex checkerboard patterns that cuttlefish can do, but that partly might be because they're small and we haven't tested anything like that. Um, but yeah, they can change their color pretty dramatically um, from essentially white to this brown model of the, uh, appearance. Does a predator uh, sense the same wavelength of light that, that they're producing? And what is, what, what is the major predator? Yeah, so the question was, um, uh, what are the predators for these? And what uh, amount of light are they detecting? It's a great question. Um, I'll tell you the other half of this first, which is that, because this also hides the squid from when they're the predator, right? And so typically, they're eating shrimp. They're eating shrimp that are often larger than they are. Um, and then in terms of predators, you know, we think it's large fish. Um, there's some reports of, of seals playing an important role. I don't know about in Hawaii. Um, but, uh, and so I don't have a good answer for you on what their light detection is. Um, a, a question related to that I get a lot is, do we know for sure that this is what it does? And, um, and so I'll say the answer to that is no. Um, so the evidence for it, though, is that um, you know, so this, this general process called counter-illumination occurs in a number of marine systems. Um, you can imagine a lot like counter-shading, which is if you can picture a dolphin here with a, a black top and a white bottom, it performs that same function, where things looking down see dark, and if you're looking up, you see light. And here, by doing it with the bacterial light, you have the opportunity to manipulate it. Um, we'd love to do predation studies with these. It's just um, practically, it's, it's very difficult to do. Yeah. Uh, there have been predation studies in shrimp that make their own luminescence in a very similar pattern, and it's been shown that they were protected with the presence of the light. Um, so that's kind of as close as we can get. Any yeah. Absolutely. So the question was, um, if bacteria require this aggregation, and there's a parallel to that in a lot of uh, pathogenic and hospital situations, if you inhibit aggregation, inhibit biofilm formation, uh, would that reduce infections? And, and the answer is definitely yes. Um, and there's actually a number of labs here on campus that study it, both in bacteria um, and in yeast, such as Candida albicans. Um, a lot of uh, these organisms will form biofilms in uh, like catheter tubing. And as a result, they're very hard to clear out. They set up shop there. They can release new bacteria or yeast into the, the patient, and, uh, and they don't have a good way. So it, absolutely, things that can limit the ability of bacteria to stick to surfaces 
and stick to each other are being pursued in a number of uh, contexts. Thank you.